Okay, we're back. Uh, thanks for watching everybody. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's coverage of IOD. I'm Dave Vellante, and we're here at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, covering IOD, wall-to-wall -wall coverage as usual. Uh, you can tweet us, I'm at dvellante. Uh, my co-host today is uh, Jeffrey T. Kelly, uh, K-E-L-L-Y. <laughs> so uh, please, uh, please uh, tweet us and let us know what you think if you have any questions. So, uh, I'd like to introduce my co-host now, who's going to introduce the next guest, Jeff. Uh, welcome everybody, just a quick correction, Jeffrey F. Kelly. Oh, Jeffrey F, no, I, I always know. mess that up. So Jeffrey F. Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Right, imp important right. Uh, for the Twitter handle. Uh, in, in any event, welcome everybody, thanks for, thanks for watching today. First guest, very interesting uh, company, Bill Hartman, president of Terra Echoes. Welcome to theCUBE, first appreciate time appreciate it, Jeff. on theCUBE, and we appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, thanks Bill for, for coming on. Why don't you uh, set it up? Uh, we were talking off camera, and uh, somebody made the comment, you know, people around here care about data, and you made the comment about, your customers care about getting value uh, out of data, getting insights out of data. So tell us what Terra Echoes does, and then we'll get into it. Okay, well the short story is, uh, and, and Jeff made a little distinction about real time uh, just a minute ago. What, what we do is true real time, live. Our applications are all about where a customer has to determine in the moment uh, what's going on and then be able to take action on it. So it isn't, it, uh, the speed at which we do processing is just means to an end. And so our applications, we started with a problem that was incredibly time critical based on multiple sensors and we didn't have a way to solve that problem until about four or five years ago when we came across IBM Infosphere Streams. So it's a streaming technology, there are other streaming technologies out there, but what's unique about it is it uh, was designed and it's exceptional for not just streaming data, but massive amounts of big unstructured data. So what we're able to do in that is take, just as a real quick example, cyber and a video and let's say uh, social media. But let's say there was some application where those three particular things are available but haven't been able to be brought together before. What we can do in that and what we've already demonstrated to our customers is on the fly, continuously taking those three different sensors, if you will, analyzing them and then acting on that information in a, in a continuous moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're not doing is we're not persisting to a database, what we're doing is the data never stops. We actually are analyzing it and acting on it on the fly. In real time? In real time, true real time. So take us through some examples of how customers are using this. Well, we're a startup, so we're early. Uh, most of our focus has been on the, what's called the intelligence community, the IC, and the Department of Defense where, you know, if one was to go Google their sensor problems, they're literally drowning in, in information and they, they can't get to the information fast enough. It's, it's just all sort of dropping off the table, if you will given their traditional uh, ways to analyze it. And so uh, you know, what they need is a way uh, to achieve time critical insight into the information and then be able to act on that. You know, not everything, but, mm -hmm. but there are certainly times, whether it be in cyber warfare, or whether it be in protection of critical assets or something tactical in the field, uh, you know, picture Kabul or someplace like that where you'd want to be able to know if you're the guy on the ground, you know, SEAL Team 6, let's just make this fun. And, and you were doing something where you wanted to know you've got the best available information and the insight from that information before you bang the door down. Okay, so you essentially have a, a software platform, a software application, how would you what describe What we do it? is, is we're, we're building on Infosphere Streams. So Infosphere Streams is a fabric that allows us to then build on top. We develop our own environment on top of Infosphere Streams and then we develop our analytics, either, either proprietary analytics or we take analytics that are already out there but that were developed for the serial world, and then we adapt them into our environment and, and tailor those to the applications. And what's the business model? Um, is it a, a, you sell it as a service? You well, sell right, right now, we, eventually what we want to do is get to selling it as a service. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some tec technical reasons why today where we could sell it as a service, but it basically it's off a cluster, uh, as opposed to a cloud-based kind of a service, but as the technology, both the streaming technology evolves and our ability to adapt our analytics to it, we would see let's say maybe three to five years from now, analytics as a service being what we're doing. So you're, if I understood correctly, you're not storing the data. We don't store, now, now in a, to your point about working with integrators, certainly we, we like, and I want to put in a plug for Natiza, I can see why Rob Thomas thought was impressed with the team. We've done some early work with Natiza and they're incredible people. Uh, we love their team and, and we love their technology. But so for example, we could be working with a Natiza device where because we don't stop the data, but we might want to do some deeper analytics to inform us, let's say, five minutes from now, about something that we need to look at 
we can modify our models on the fly based on the TISA or a green plumb or some other device informing us. So there's a, a go-between between between the two of us, which would be similar to, we could talk to Vivizimo, mm -hmm. we could talk to uh, Palantir, uh, or traditional database kinds of resources. So we're not, we're not only taking live data, but we're taking all data as if it was live. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so uh, the, the way I kind of envision the scenario is, as the data comes in, the kind of that streaming component is, is kind of the entryway. Mm -hmm. And that data kind of flows into another, uh, either a database, uh, like an Ateez, or maybe a Hadoop, or whatever it might be, for either deep an analytics or more SQL type analytics. And then as you mentioned, you can feed that back into uh, the streaming system right. to take advantage of what you've learned over the, over the long term yeah. and, and incorporate that with kind of the in the moment analytics. Right, and, and I, I I think of this very crudely as the canary in the coal mine. I mean, there there are clearly applications today where you need to know as fast as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. But we've also talked to people that are in industrial control systems. You know, so picture a power turbine, you know, a major industrial sized power turbine, where if you could manage all the different sensors that are on that more precisely than you can now, truly in millisecond time, based on looking at 400 sensors, all in the moment to say, you know, one sensor would have said speed up, but really what you need to do is slow down, mm -hmm. just to make it real simple. Um, if they could shave maybe a half a percent to a percent more in the, the efficiency of that turbine, the, the, the investment pays for itself almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we see a number of different applications, but it's such a different way about thinking how to actually use data. To me, it's, it's actually more obvious <laughs> what data is worth mm -hmm. if you're using it real time, but what we're used to, what the world's used to, is putting it into a database, right. and then somebody has to ask the question, and mm -hmm. then was that the right question? What, what we're doing is really asking the question, we're, we're never not asking the question. We're asking it all the time, and then adjusting the question on the mm -hmm. fly as well. So yeah, and, and a lot of that was due to uh, technical limitations. Oh, I mean, sure. there certainly yeah. weren't. Sure. It just wasn't wasn't possible yeah. until recently. And but I want to talk a little bit about kind of the you know the sensors themselves. Okay. Um, you know, we heard about about ten years ago, RFID kind of hit the scene, got a lot of a lot of press. It was kind of going to be the new thing, and then we kind of kind of died down. And now we're kind of back to that Internet of Things and right. things being censored. Where are we? Uh, you know, you're, you've got your feet on the ground in this in this space in terms of connecting all our devices. I mean, where are we in terms of, is, is the average industrial component censored at this point? Is the average uh, consumer product censored at this point? Where are we in terms of actually getting those physical sensors there so that we can actually grab data from them? Yeah, well, realistically there's a continuum. I mean, there's people on the cutting edge, and I, I was at a uh, breakfast here with IBM the other day, and one of the IBM champions who does a lot of consulting to Fortune 500 companies said, she has Fortune 500 companies that are stu still doing a lot with paper. So, so even in those kinds of companies, it, they're not the Internet of Things yet. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, you, you know, uh, whatever, how many, eight billion cell phones or something like mm -hmm. that, and smartphones and where all that's going. Um, in our early applications, where we're going is where the sensors are already there, mm -hmm. uh, clearly already there. It might be in the military, it might be in the Department of Defense, it might, you know, satellite imagery, full motion video, uh, you know, what the military, and the commercial world has really come to like in the last 10 years, I mean, uh, you know, we're on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, video, more and more and more and mm -hmm. more video. So the military is using it a lot, businesses are using it more and more. I was talking to you off air about a company, a uh, commercial company uh, that, that's using uh, facial recognition kinds of technology to recognize their shelf space mm -hmm. and whether shelves uh, what's on the shelf is placed properly or not. So to us, that facial recognition input is a sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, your global positioning, us the three being right here, and that we're static for a certain amount of time, and, and being able to monitor what's going out on the air or whatever, would be a couple of different sensors. Uh, we also monitor cyber. So for example, uh, this isn't speaking to the broad market, but you could picture something like a Stuxnet mm -hmm. in a broader sense where someone is trying to attack a facility but, but nowadays, it isn't, it isn't a single vector kind of an attack. It would be cyber from multiple different angles, if you will, and, and physical from multiple different angles. And all of those things are likely in an industrial setting to have some kinds of sensors on them. It might be a fence, it might be video systems, it might be how your system is operating. Mm -hmm. And you take all that and you put it together, it's going to tell you something that you wouldn't otherwise know. And in some applications, that's, that's critical to know. And some it isn't. I mean, whether we could help Nordstrom or Target help somebody buy something more quickly. I think we could, but whether that's worth all, the ROI probably isn't right. there yet. Yeah. So your focus today is really on solving those hard problems uh, that are 
related to potentially national security and, and other yeah. factors. Talk about um, what your clients and how you envision your clients um, accommodating this new capability because you started off this segment saying um, your, your customers have all this data that they're ingesting and they have no way to really process it. So right. how are they changing their processes to be able to you know, manage all this or actually get outcomes? Can you describe the outcomes that they're getting and how are they changing their processes in order to be able to exploit the capability? Okay. And, I, and I wouldn't want to overstate how we're driving customers to change processes just yet. We really... How do you envision it? We pivoted yeah. this, yes. Yeah. So how, how we envision it is our customers, uh, particularly in the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, already have a very serially oriented workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and that workflow moves from sensor input and, and it might be multiple sensors. Uh, they call it uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. But mm -hmm. the analogy to what happens in the commercial world I think is exactly the same in BI, where what they're doing is they're serially processing based on some sort of uh, uh, data-driven, whether, whether it's uh, uh, machine-driven or person-driven decision to sort of do a 80-20, what's important, what's not important. And, and that's what's breaking down right now is there's so much data coming through, they're not able to figure out, you know, Gee, what did I just miss? Uh, you know, someone yesterday here at the show was talking to me about a subway overseas where uh, someone recently committed suicide in the subway. And the subway system, like New York, London, Singapore, everywhere else, has somebody or four or five guys in a room looking at 30 or 40 different monitors trying to keep up with what's going on. That just doesn't work. And so now there's, he was telling me, a backlash in this particular city where they've got this video over and over and over again of somebody committing suicide despite all this technology, not being able to get the information about mm -hmm. what was about to happen, and perhaps say, this man's been loitering there, or he's doing something unusual, why don't we have uh, someone go over and, and take his arm or ask him if he needs some help or something like that. Now, I don't know if that's exactly the right application, but there, there are workflow, my point is there are workflows already out there, and what we picture is plugging into those workflows not telling them blow your workflow up. Really, again, in the Natiza example or the Vivismo, plugging into an approach that's already there, but making that approach much better. Yeah, so that's a huge advantage, obviously, for your business because uh, otherwise you're going. <laughs> well, gonna yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're, eventually this is going to change the world, but we got to take <laughs> baby steps. Yeah, yeah. Talk about the company, Bill. Um, you mentioned your startup. Can you talk about you know where you're at, funding, and things of that nature? Sure. We raised. Thank you. Uh, we raised a seed round last year, led by Flywheel Ventures and True Ventures. Mm -hmm. um, True Ventures and Flywheel both both very excited about big data and saw the opportunity with what we were doing with the streams fabric and the analytics to to really be you know the old thing about catching the wave. Uh, so we, we think we're right there and, and really excited about it and we'll probably be going out in about 12 months for our A round. For an A round, okay. For an so, A round. So, you're, you're, so we were seed stage. You're seed stage. Um, can you talk about how much you raised? Uh, a couple million. Yeah, okay, so a sizable seed round. Yeah, and, and yeah seed round and, and we got traction with several customers. You know, we, we, uh, our initial customer uh, we delivered a system to in uh, January, a uh, pilot system and we have a follow on with them that's a significant uh, development for the next year. And then we're also talking to two or three other government customers and a couple commercial applications. So, you know, we hope to, to see several more orders in the next two or three months that would help, you know, lay the groundwork for the A round. So what's the 100 day plan? You know, what's the big milestones to get ready for that, that A round? What are you really focused well, on? I'm, I'm hopping on a plane tonight to go to Washington, D.C. and uh, it's not a 100 day plan, it's a, it's a two or three <laughs> week plan. 100 hour plan. Yeah, no, we've, we've got several things teed up where, um, just like in the commercial world, uh, there's no problem getting uh, meetings with people to talk about big data. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we're talking to all the name brand intelligence community agencies, and, and again, it's, we're not selling to all of them, but we're talking to all of them, because they all have their verticals. I mean, we all probably think of the U.S. government as this monolith, but what the FBI needs versus what the CIA needs versus what the National Reconnaissance needs are all completely different. They're all similar workflows, but different, and so with one, what we're focused on is uh, uh, live, what, what we're doing with them is live feature extraction from full motion video on the fly. So, so picture the video is always coming, multiple, multiple channels, let's say 32 channels of full motion video, and what we're going to develop for them, in the analytics, is to be able to pull out particular features that they want to see as the video is flowing by. 
Um, certainly we see down the road lots of commercial applications for that, but right now this is a workflow for them that's just bottlenecked. Is there, um, we had Jeff Jonas on yesterday, he was talking about geospatial. Mm -hmm. um, can, is, that, is there a play for that in, in what you guys are doing? Yeah, we actually, I probably, uh, we underemphasize that. The geospatial part ties into all we do. Our, our company actually has a very, very strong GIS background. Uh, and, and we see the play, not the play, but the need for geospatial, because you, you can't just analyze the information, you got to act on the information. If you don't know where the information is, you, both in cyber, there's actually kind of some neat things about cyber geo, uh, where things are in cyberspace, but certainly in the world we all get right here, uh, what underlies almost everything we do is the geo component, which also is what we're doing in real time. Mm -hmm. Is there? Live, real, um, true real time. How much uh, discussion, engineering, um, you know, thought do you guys give to privacy in that context, given that geo is so fundamental to what you do? We haven't given it much thought yet, particularly because we're plugging into workflows that are already there. I mean, there, there, are, there are bigger issues like what's going on in the Senate and the House with cyber and policy issues mm -hmm. and all that. We're, we're a startup. <laughs> We're focused on you know the initial applications and not getting I don't want to say we're self-insuring, but you know I think a lot yeah. of that's going to work out. And particularly for the applications we're in now, privacy isn't the issue. You mm -hmm. know it's really uh, if you will proprietary sensors mm -hmm. that the customer owns. Well, yeah. I think that's certainly going to be an issue uh, yeah. going down uh, down the line. I think another issue when it comes to uh, the type of streaming uh, real-time analytics we're talking about is, you know, it's one thing to you know for, for the system to tell you, okay, something has occurred, and another thing to be able to respond. Oh, sure. Um, to actually take take that action, a know what it is, and b being able to actually execute. Sure. Um, so you know, you're still still early days, and I th it sounds like the clients you're working with have a very, uh, really a specific use case. Mm -hmm. But how do you envision helping clients in the future actually when you start uh, maybe perhaps working with retail customers or others who, who, who this is kind of a new type of mm -hmm. uh, uh, thought process for them? Uh, how, how do you envision kind of helping them not just transform their uh, data analytics but actual culture to take advantage of real-time streaming analytics and not just say, well, there goes a, we just saw you know, a really important event just happened. Right okay, what do we do? We don't know, the yeah. time has passed. P part of it is, I'm not sure how this is all going to evolve. I think the world needs to get more, I mean, there's an awful lot of us here that are drinking the Kool-Aid saying analytics is the answer. Uh, there's an awful lot of folks that don't trust analytics yet. Mm -hmm. And so part of our business strategy early on is both to use analytics that are already available, that our customers are already using, and, and uh, David mentioned the Navy. You know, we, we'd worked closely with the Navy for several years, taking technology, uh, both technology and algorithms that the Navy had, and then adapting those into this stream, highly parallel application environment that we're operating in. And so to go back to that same customer and say, look, we're not trying to change everything you do. What we're doing is taking what you already do and do it better. You already trust your analytics. Mm -hmm. Let's work through how we've now made those analytics better. And so I, I think that's a much better way to approach it rather than trying to blow into the, the room, if you will, and say analytics is the answer <laughs> to somebody who didn't know they had a problem. Yeah. And so I, I think the world's got to get more comfortable and also understand in a lot of our applications, you know, there's a trade-off with false positives and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we're not making the decision, it's the customer making the decision on are we in full auto, if you will. Mm -hmm. If it's a cyber attack, there isn't time to have a person in the loop. So, so that might be full auto, for example. There might be other things where what we're, what we're also working on is the visualization and the display portion of all of this, mm -hmm. because if you can't communicate it, then the information, if you will, is kind of trapped somewhere, right. and it's falling off the table for another reason. And so uh, I, I think there's going to be an evolution, and I hope our, our strategy of working with customers that are already ha having a big problem, is a time critical problem, and are already somewhat at least predisposed to doing analytics on that data anyway. I mean, most of our customers are some of the very early, some of the mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. big data customers in the world. Uh, and so uh, getting rung out with them, I think, is a pretty good test, but also as they ring it out, there'll be other folks that'll kind of see it working and be a little more, you know, the classic more uh, crossing the chasm and all that right. kind of stuff. So did I understand you correctly, Bill? You're saying you're not spending a lot of time worrying about false positives, that's your... So no, 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 uh, no, no, I, I, I'm saying from a technology standpoint, yeah, we're not worrying about that. It, 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 it's really, for example, uh, we might be solving problems, we are solving problems with streams in our analytics today that literally could not be solved 
a year ago. Right. And in being able to solve those, it may be that we'll come up with, let's say, call it a figure of merit or a confidence factor to the decision maker that would say, you now have a 50 or 60% confidence based on analytics that this is what's happening. Uh, what, we're, what we're, in most cases, or in some cases, uh, we're not going to say it's 100% because it's based on mm -hmm. analytics. Now it's really fast and it's incredible analytics across multiple sensor streams, um, but it's a it, in, a, in a sense it's still a judgment call. And what we're trying to do is provide data and inform the decision maker and, uh, uh, and, act, and allow them to act on that however their policy de describes doing it. Right, right, okay. But the capability so. is there to be full auto. And one, one of the things we can do in streams and we've done and demonstrated is, let's say, uh, just to make up some example, you've got five different sensors available right now, and there's a couple more sort of in the closet that are really expensive, but you can't use those unless you have higher justification. What you can do in streaming with our analytics is you, you can not just do the analytics, but then you can gain insight, let's say, in a few seconds, and then based on that insight, turn on those three other sensors and then bring those into the party and then raise your confidence factor based on the analytics maybe to 80%, just to make up some numbers. But what we're able to do in the fabric is not just the analytics, but actually take action such as turning on a video, analyzing that video, then based on the video, turning on some other sensor input, and so you're processing and acting on all the information as it's streaming through. Can you, my last question <coughs> is, in, is the data sources. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where are they coming from? How do you see them changing okay. over time? And, and you know, what does that mean to you and your customers? Well, the, the obvious thing seems to be, it's all, essentially someday it's all going to be unstructured. I mean, I, I mean the numbers just in, are, are all going that way. And the reason we picked Infosphere Streams is because it was tailored, it was developed for the U.S. government several years ago specifically to handle unstructured mm -hmm. data. Uh, and so it really doesn't run out of gas. Uh, so, it could be text, could be video, could be uh, satellite imagery, could be social media, and, and we've demonstrated all those different kinds of applications. It could be binary uh, up, up through the packets uh, for, for video, uh, cyber. Um, so we're able to handle all that kind of data, and so we're pretty agnostic. We're not too worried about where the world's going from a data structure standpoint because we think we've got a fabric that allows us to be able to operate on all of it. Bring which it is, on. Which is a pretty incredible, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, to what you're talking about before, yeah, I think IBM's done an incredible job building a great portfolio, uh, but what I keep harping on to, to Rob Thomas and these other guys is Streams is home built, and, and Streams is the <laughs> most incredible, Infosphere Streams, to put in a plug for IBM, you know, we've looked a little bit at Twitter Storm and, and uh, Yahoo S4, and there's some high performance computing streaming platforms out there as well, but they're still more research oriented. Uh, Infosphere Streams is, uh, I th they're announcing their, their 3.0 release version of it. It's prime time, it's, it's what you'd expect if you were uh, a business using it. Uh, and, and what it can do is just incredible. And, and it's, it was developed by IBM. Well, let's not forget, uh, IBM does more R&D than any company on the, you know, in, the, in, the, in the industry, and, uh, and you're right on. I mean, a lot of innovation actually comes out of IBM. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, Oracle's CEO Larry Ellison has made that point many times that he does worry about IBM because they do so much R&D. So that was his way of you know, backhanded slap yeah. at HP, <laughs> of course, but, uh, but it's, it's true. I mean, IBM is renowned for its uh, uh, emphasis on R&D. All right, Bill Hartman, uh, Tara Echoes, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Really great story. Good luck with the, uh, with the, the company and uh, the next round, and Thank good you. luck with your trip to Washington this week. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. All right. Call All right. ahead. Yeah. Keep it right there. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it right there. We'll be right back live from Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's coverage of IBM's IOD conference. Keep it right there. <laughs>